Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2. I was actually born in 1969 um, on John Lennon's birthday, which fascinated him. Um, he said to my dad, no, you're not sort of arsehole he's going to turn out to be. Um, it's funny, growing up as a kid, having a father like George Martin, you can't compare it to anything else. I've never actually swapped dads with anyone. Um, but we didn't necessarily, myself and my sister didn't actually grow up in a in a, in a terribly musical house, apart from, as a kid, I noticed my dad played the piano a lot, and odd people would come back and forth. In fact, when I was a playgroup, my, um, they went around the class, and I was about four or five, and they said, you know, what do your parents do for a living? And they, you know, you know, my dad's an accountant, my dad's a lawyer, my dad's a truck driver, whatever. And I said, my dad just sits at home and plays the piano. And it turns out he was writing, I think he was writing the music for Live and Let Die, the film at the time. And there's huge embarrassment amongst my parents. They go, you know, he's not employed, you know, he's got a proper job. And so it wasn't a sort of thing. I think that, I think growing up in, in, a, in a, it was, I didn't necessarily grow up in a musical household. It wasn't, you know, I had the privilege of meeting people like Paul McCartney at an early age and, and, and meeting, you know, the Beatles at an early age, but they were just friends of my parents. It didn't mean a whole lot to me as a kid. Um, I remember when I became interested in the guitar and became interested in songwriting, Paul did say to me, he was incredibly encouraging, he goes, that's great, you know, I find it difficult to write songs and I'm Paul McCartney. So I did have a privileged sort of background as far as that goes. My parents were always uh, very wary of me getting a proper job. They, I learned to play the guitar, as you can, some people might be able to see quite badly, but behind my parents' back, you know, it was a, it was a thing, you know, don't join the music industry. Um, I'm delighted I did. In fact, I really got involved in music because my dad started to lose his hearing when I was about 16 and he needed a second pair of ears and he didn't really want to tell people he was losing his hearing. So I became his ears to a certain extent. I'd come in and try and help him. By through that, I would learn off him. And we started working together. And it was actually a great thing because I was needed to a certain extent by him, which is nice as a son and a father working together. And at the same time, he was always very good. He never had a sort of, that's my boy kind of attitude. He was always very uh, receptive to my ideas. And the fact he's been receptive to people's ideas throughout the whole of his career. And uh, he treated me no differently and was always open to, to my suggestions, however wrong they may be. And you know, God knows I made lots of wrong ones. So it gave me a chance to learn, it gave me a chance to respect him for what he does and what he's done. I, I never thought of, I was never any good um, at learning songs off by heart. I mean, you know, I bluff my way through most things. I've never been terribly accurate at playing anything. I can play a number of things very badly, but I was much more interested in playing for a reason. So as soon as I learned to play the guitar with a friend of mine, we started playing in the underground here, started playing in tube stations and playing whatever songs we could learn, basically, you know, as you do. And my parents were, my dad was especially distraught by this. He didn't want, you know, George Martin's son being arrested because it's illegal. At that stage, it was illegal to busk. In fact, the way we played it should have been illegal, but it was illegal to busk. And uh, I then got into playing bands. I formed a band, you know, as you do. And I had a great time, I think, playing in a band, learning to play an instrument. Learning to play a guitar was the best thing I ever did. And not that I practice the guitar or play it very often now, but it opens so many doors as far as if you're willing to play it to people, if you're willing to bore people with it. It's great, you know, to meet people and chat. It's like a, a great hobby to have. It's better than video games, for instance. And, and I think that being in a band taught me more about recording and music for enough than being the son of George Martin did. Because people, if you're the son of um, someone, people expect you have this knowledge, which generally you don't have. You know, people think you grew up in recording studios. And of course, I'd spent more time in studios than probably people, other people are 16, but it's still just a row of buttons. You know, if you're 16, it's still just, you know, a compressor, of course, I know what a compressor does. I hadn't got a clue for a long time because people expect you to know these things. But if you're in a band, you, especially as I was in an unsuccessful band, you have a chance to make a whole lot of mistakes and learn stuff. And the hardest thing, not that it's a bad thing, but the hardest thing if you're a son of some son of some famous or a child of a famous person is you don't get that many chance, chances to make mistakes before people go, people are hoping for the second coming, people are going, he's going to be just like his dad. And if you screw up, you're then the other way. You're then, he couldn't get a proper job. 
And so being in a sort of hidden band gave me a chance to learn. And that's what, you know, music is about evolving. It's about discovering new stuff. It's about learning new songs. It's about learning how things work. It's not about playing the same old things every day. Then things become boring. After playing in a band, I carried on playing in, I always played in, played with people, always like going on tour and playing in pubs and clubs. So I thought, thought, you know, it's just, it was just great fun. And I started writing jingles, I started writing commercials. Um, I started doing gasoline adverts, that was my, for, for France. French gasoline is, was the peak of my life. And that was when I was at university. And then when I left university, I wanted to become a record producer. I wanted to write music for people and produce people, but I couldn't, I couldn't, I didn't have any, you know, what do you do? You can't go, I'm the son of George Martin, let me produce you, you know, it's, or, or give me a job. And so I ended up working in press. And at the same time, I started looking at bands. And funny enough, my dad was sort of, he was nervous, I think, of me following in his footsteps at this stage. And I saw a band called My Life Story. They're playing at the, 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 My Life Story, they're playing at the, the Astoria in London. And I went to go see them play and I thought they were good and they were, had a whole lot of strings and I did an arrangement of them and produced them. And they released a single that became sort of number one in Melody Maker and Enemy and the Cool magazines. And someone showed it to my dad and said, look what your son's been up to. And I was just doing it in the evenings, you know, as you do if you're a fan of music and you want to get into music. And that kind of opened doors to me. I left the press job and became a producer. Pro production engineering is, is something that you learn stuff all the time with, like any sort of, sort of music. I mean, I think, for me, starting out and how I am now, if I can work in any form of music, I'm happy. It doesn't matter. It's just, you know, I think um, I produce more stuff now and remix and mix stuff now, probably because in a way it's what people expect of me and maybe I'm okay at it. The Love Project came from, it came from the fact that they needed to do a show. It was uh, George Harrison and Guy Le Liberté, who's the head of Cirque du Soleil, were friends. And they decided to do a show and they decided they couldn't have anyone singing Beatles songs a la Mamma Mia. They didn't want, you know, a chorus singing Hey Jude on stage. And I think that's the right decision. And so they approached my dad and I just had quite a lot of success in the UK doing classical stuff at the time. And Apple came to see me and I sat with my dad and talked to them about it. And I said to them, I could try doing, creating a gig that never happened. And Neil Aspinall, who was the head of Apple, said, you know, I'd love, you know, till we talked about, because he was their roadie, we talked about their shows. We talked about, you know, starting off with Long Tall Sally and finishing with Twist and Shout, or, you know, creating this thing. And I said, well, listen, with Pro Tools and digital stuff, I can perhaps create a gig that never happened. So under complete secrecy, uh, I went upstairs here into a very small room and took some material and I took the beginning, the, sorry, the, the drums from the end and get back because I realized they're the same tempo and because I thought I'd start a gig, never happened with a drum solo going into a song and started moving things around and you know, people said mashing up, I always thought it was a bit rude um, and then thought how am I going to start this and got the piano from a day in the life and turned that backwards because I thought if that makes a good ending it'll make a good beginning as it sucks into the chord from Hard Day's Night. I just had fun, you know, and my view was, you know, if I can impress my dad doing Beatles stuff then that's pretty good, you know, as a son you're always trying to impress your dad I think or, or compete in some way and it just so happened that it was on Beatles stuff and I was auditioning for the Beatles and I really thought that they probably wouldn't like it. You know, I, I really thought that people would think this is a really bad idea. It sounds like a bad idea if you just talk about it. And I then took Within You, Without You and Tomorrow Never Knows and stuck those together because I thought this will definitely get me fired, if nothing else. And they came and they really liked it. They liked the ideas. And so I ended up becoming um, the sort of... <laughs> you know, the sort of legacy which I kind of fought against for a long time, and here I am now in Abbey Road talking about it, um, suddenly became part of it. And uh, I backed up all the catalogue and the Pro Tools and started working on this, on this project, which, which became love. Um, I came with my dog Stan and went to my room and started working, you know, we had a list. I worked with the director of the show and my dad. My dad would come in sort of two days a week and I'd play him ideas and we'd work through stuff. So he was kind of producing me doing it. But the bosses were 
the Beatles, Ringo and Paul, and Olivia, Olivia Harrison and Yoko Ono, who were representing George and John. And it was important that they liked everything. They had to hear everything before it was passed on anywhere, anywhere else. And the interesting thing about the Beatles, it's such a protected circle, rightfully so, that if you do something and no one likes it, no one ever hears it. You know, and that's actually quite a good thing for me because it means I could take risks. You know, occasionally people at Abbey Road were sort of, you know, people who never hadn't heard anything, which the majority of people here didn't like the idea of what we were doing and didn't like the idea of me coming in and changing. People think it's changing history, but it's not because I'm not deleting anything. I wasn't, you know, I, I was just really trying to do something different. And Ringo and Paul would come in. The funny thing is they come and listen to stuff and they're not allowed to take stuff away either. It's not like you give them a CD. The only chance of them listening to the new mixes we were doing was by coming here and listening to them. And then later as we got the technology sorted out and secure drives were done, I would go and see Yoko and sit down with her and work through stuff. And it's fascinating. For me it was fascinating because I have no past with them. You know, I have no, I certainly wasn't there at the time. And so it's kind of on an even, I'm, I'm, I'm way down the pecking order, but it's kind of, I mean, on an even keel, as it were. There's no history, I have no, you know, experience of anything they did. So it was quite easy for me just to go, do you like it or you don't, what, you don't, what don't you like about it? And they were very proactive in it, um, all four of them, you know, the two wives and Ringo and Paul. And, you know, Paul was, Paul was the one that would give me the fear because he's such a good musician. I mean, Ringo is a pretty good musician as well, and they'd, they'd you know, they know their stuff and they know their own material and uh, occasionally in fact when we were doing the show I sat down with Paul I went through each bit and you know played in bits in the theatre and it was great it was a great evening and he goes you know he said to me you know I just I really I, I have to say I really like what you've done and you, what you've done has been sympathetic with my music and I really appreciate that for me that was just you know the best but when, we, when the show, when it came to the opening of the show, at the very beginning when people walk into the theatre and they're sitting down, I couldn't work out what, because they wanted Beatles music to play, and someone said, well, why don't you just do another 60 minutes of, and I mean, it took me two years to do the 90 minutes. So I decided to get as many Beatles on as I could by taking the vocals off, which is difficult with Beatles stuff, because there's so much leakage on the tracks, and just play the backing tracks. So it's like the Beatles are playing, they're backing as you walk in. So you have Dear Prudence with no vocal, you know, you have Should Know Better with no vocal, and Penny Lane with no vocal. And the idea was that it would counterpoint because when because starts, it's just vocals. So I'm sitting with Paul, and he's two, my dad's there, and Paul's there, and Penny Lane's playing in the in the ceiling of the theatre. And Paul goes, and what's this then? And I went, It's Penny Lane. He goes, I know it's bloody Penny Lane, but what is what's it doing in the ceiling? And I said, well, I just thought it would be an idea to, you know, because they listened to everything. I thought it would be an idea to maybe put the backing tracks up there. And he's like, oh, OK, you know, I'll have a listen. And it's right there because it is their music. And, you know, and my dad sometimes, you know, it's, he feels embarrassed because it's, it's not his music and it certainly isn't mine. It is there. It's, they were, there were four Beatles and it was their band and that was it. There's no fifth Beatle. With music, there's things you'd like to do. I, I wish I could play things better, you know. I've always thought, you know, it'd be great to, to really learn how to play the bass properly, or guitar properly, or piano properly, you know. Um, but uh, it's just a question of time. Maybe I'll start watching our video tunes and, and then become a better musician. But, you, you know, there's, I'd like to, you know, work with you know, a really good young band. At the same time, I'd love to go and do something like the Love Project with something else, you know, with taking, taking stuff and creating, make people listen to music again. The good thing about Love is it does, people do analyse and people do listen, and people don't have it on the background, they do actually get into it. And that's why we do music, we do music because we're passionate about it. And so, really, I mean, I, I'm about to write a television thing, I'm, you know, you just, it's a question of writing, producing and being creative and anything that lets you do that, you take. And every day, I just can't believe I, I can do this for a living. You know, I was told by my parents for years it's an impossible job to do for a living, despite coming from my background, because I think maybe when I have kids, I'll be doing the same thing, you know, don't go into music, you know. But it's just, it's, you do it because you love it. And, that's, and, and if you can get paid for it, it means you don't have to do another job to get in the way as well, so it's fantastic. I would say to anyone learning an instrument, anyone you know, struggling, because let's face it, we all struggle with instruments all the time, and we struggle with music. 
is that no matter how hard it is, it's hard for everyone. And that love that you have for it, never let go of it. Because you, know, you might be trying to learn a song and go, I'm never going to learn this. But the fact of it is, you do. You do learn and you do move on. And the thing to do is never ever give up. Never ever lose that drive and that, that feeling you get when you work something out or you hear some great music. Because it's much better than sitting down and watching the telly. I mean, the thing about, the thing about music is that I think if anyone's toured, I used to tour a lot, you know, you end up kind of working on automa automatic pilot. And, uh, and you get, you start amusing yourself with stuff. I was playing bass in a band, and you start playing the same things over and over again. And, and uh, I was once in Germany, and I used to jump off the stage. And, and I jumped off the stage, and I had no idea until I left the theater, how far I was jumping. We played the end of the concert, and I jumped off the stage, and there was no crowd there. I mean, let's face it, it wasn't that popular, but there was, there was a break before the people. And I launched off the stage, and seeing the band's faces, and they looked at me, I was like, oh my God, I'm going to die. I'm going to die in a, in a shit club in Germany. And I dropped about 12 feet. My bass amp almost followed me, because I you know, didn't have wireless or anything. I just, the bass, <laughs> it was like Wile E. Coyote. The, my lead unraveled. <laughs> it's the only thing that kept me alive. And an Ampeg SV200 over there called, came, came crashing out afterwards. But yeah, I spent most of my time being laughed at by people. You know, I think it's important. I think it's important in studios to have a good laugh. It's funny, I mean, you know, it's, you know, the Beatles, it's one thing, that was, one thing that was shocking for me from listening to all of the tapes, everything they did, was not you know, how serious it was. It was how much kind of fun there is in the tapes. Even when you think, oh, the White Album, they didn't get on. They're really cracking up most of the time. And it's kind of, you forget that actually they came to the studio to have a good time. And all the other stuff you read about happened in offices and accountants and all that sort of stuff. Most of the studio stuff is great. And that's the thing about music. Music should be fun. You know, if you're learning music, have a laugh with it. And don't sit on your own and do it. You know, find someone to play with. Because... Uh, the great thing about music is there's always someone worse than you. you can, I mean, in my case, you really have to hunt them out. But, you know, there is. And so show off to someone. Well, the, I mean, the great thing about the internet is the fact you can, you can delve into the world of songs and work out chords. And one of the problems I struggle from is you look on the internet, and quite often the, the chord sheets are wrong. And there's some guy going, if you know the right way this song goes, please write in. You think, oh, that's no good. I can work that out. And the great thing about iVideo tunes is it breaks down that barrier and you've suddenly been taught by professionals. You've suddenly been taught in a simple way by professionals. It's kind of inspired me. You know, I saw iVideo tunes before, before I got involved in it. And it's inspired me to like going, right, I'm going to see if I can learn the piano better now. You know, and I think that's a great thing. You know, people don't have access to the best people in the world. And now, with iVideo tunes, they do. You can be taught by some of the best people, you know, from home. And the way it's shot and the way it's done is very simple. You know, if I can understand it, it's very simple. So I think it's a great thing. It's a great learning tool for people. And, uh, and I think hopefully it'll, be, it'll create great musicians in the future. Hi, I'm Giles Martin. I'm here in Abbey Road Studio 2 to talk about Yellow Submarine. Now, Yellow Submarine was written as a children's song. It was written overnight by Paul as a children's song. It's deliberate, he said. And, and apparently he, he went around and played it to Donovan and said, what do you think? And Donovan came up with the lyric, sky blue, sea of green. And it was recorded on the 26th of June, 1966, in the studio here, quite simply. You know, it was a recorded for Ringo to sing. And according to Jeff Emmerich, my dad had food poisoning that day. And my mum, who worked here, was actually my dad's assistant, was, was at the console for the recording of Yellow Submarine. I must ask her, actually, because I'm not sure she'd been, she'd been credited. She might sue. And the song is just very simple, a simple children's song, recorded in a pass of you know, acoustic guitar, drums and bass, and then sung by Ringo. 
and then sort of put on the back burner for a week where the Beatles decided to throw a party in here on the 1st of July where they invited, you know, the Brian Jones and Marianne Faithful and, you know, 60s people. The funny thing about, at the time in the press, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones were these arch rivals, but they can't see would turn up at each other. They were actually friends. They turned up at each other, each person's sessions the whole time, especially at this particular period of time. And the idea was to create a sort of party atmosphere. And so they had everyone seeing the choruses. There's a huge effects cupboard that used to be in here. There's still some old effects here with chains, people blowing bubbles. Apparently Brian Jones was clinking glasses. I think it's probably what he was very good at at the time. So they created a seascape, if you like. And actually my dad was very expert at this because he'd made a whole lot of records with Peter Sellers and Spike Milligan and the Goons, who are a famous British institution, where they, they used, they made their own effects all the time. So they sat down in here and they made their own effects tapes. In fact, if you listen, um, when I worked on the Love album, I used all these sound effects for the beginning of Good Night for Octopus's Garden to go under the water. Another track of the four track, because they bounced the original recording to do all these effects, just has the C, just has the sound of swishing C going on. The, on a fade is brought in and out, you'll hear. There's quite, a, there's quite an interesting thing, kind of a modern thing, which I never knew, which is, if you listen to the song and it says, and the band began to play, there's a brass band that kicks in, and that's just a sample of a brass band. They just found a brass recording from the EMI tape library and stuck it in the mix. There was no brass instruments recorded for the record. It was just a sample, you know, very early days of sampling. And then once everyone had done all their sea shanty bits, they had them all marching around the studio singing the chorus at the end to the original chorus vocals they recorded a week before. And it's funny, the, despite this sort of malaise of people singing at the end of the song, you actually have a very tight chorus sound because the original was recorded again a Beatles style, slowed down and sped up again to make it poppy. So it's the combination of Beatles one week preparing a very, very tight pop, even though it's a children's song, but a very prepared recording, and the next week just creating chaos and energy around it to create a sing-along music. And that's how, that's how you get Yellow Submarine. Yellow Submarine was written, and the film of Yellow Submarine was inspired by the title. The Beatles were under contract to make a number of films, and Brian Epstein decided one should be a cartoon, because it meant no Beatles involvement, and the Beatles didn't even provide the voices for the film. My father was, they had to provide songs, which occasionally they come up with a song, and they go, oh, we'll put on Yellow Submarine, you know, all together now, hey, bulldog. I think all we did is love is on it. But the score my dad wrote, and when the film came out, it was clearly clear, and the Beatles were like, yeah, that's good. And they accepted it. This is the tuning video for Yellow Submarine by the Beatles. In this song, the guitar is tuned a half step below standard pitch, plus it may be just a little bit flatter than that because of tape speed. So here's the first string. This would be ringing as an E flat. The second string ringing as a B flat. Third string ringing as a G flat. Fourth, ringing as a D flat. Fifth, ringing as an A flat. And sixth, ringing as an E flat. And that's the tuning for Yellow Submarine. In the town where I was born, lived a man who sailed the sea.
This is the verse section of Yellow Submarine by the Beatles. This song is in the key of G, but the tuning is a half step below standard tuning and maybe a little flatter than that as well because of tape speed, so be sure to check out the tuning video for those exact pitches. So while the chords will appear to be in the key of G, it'll actually be a half step below that to someone's ear. Uh, we'll walk through the verse section, I'll play it at speed and then slow it down. That's the basic four measure section that repeats to form the verse parts of the song. That's also what the song begins with. Uh, the first chord is a D7 chord, so that's played with the first finger on the first fret of the second string, the second finger on the second fret of the third string, and the third finger on the second fret of the first string, and then play four strings. So that's a D7, also called a D dominant seven. Then the next chord is a C major. You can keep uh, the first finger where it is on the first fret of the second string, and then move the second finger to the second fret of the fourth string, and then the third finger to the third fret of the fifth string, and play five strings. What can be a little tricky about this section is that the second chord only lasts for a beat. So you have three beats of the initial chord and then one beat to get to the next chord and then going on to the next measure. So that change will look like this. So you really have to get to that C chord quickly and then on to the next chord. Uh, that next chord is a G major. Uh, there's a couple different ways to finger this. Um, probably the easiest in this case is to use the second finger on the second fret of the fifth string, add the third finger to the third fret of the sixth string, and then wrap the fourth finger back here on the third fret of the first string, and then strum all six strings. That's probably easiest because going from the C major to the G major, uh, you can just hop the second and third finger down to the next string from the uh, fourth and fifth down to the fifth and sixth, just like that, and then just throw the fourth finger down. However, if that's hard for you to get the fourth finger on like that, another option would be to use the first finger on the second fret of the fifth string, the second finger on the third fret of the sixth string, and then the, either the third finger or the fourth finger on the third fret of the first string. The second chord that's on the last beat of the second measure is an E minor. So once again, if we're doing this version of the G major, it's very easy to get to this E minor. Just keep the second finger where it is on the uh, second fret of the fifth string and add the third finger to the second fret of the fourth string and strum all six strings. Moving on to the third measure, there's an A minor chord. First finger on the first fret of the second string, second finger on the second fret of the fourth string, and then the third finger on the second fret of the third string. Then five strings for that one. And then the chord at the end of that measure is a C major, which we've already seen before. To get to that from the A minor, just take off the third finger and add it on the third fret of the fifth string. So there's the A minor, switching to the C major. And from there, back to a D7 in the fourth measure. And then the last uh, chord in that measure is a G major. And then the four uh, measure cycle will repeat again for the verse. So I'll play the verse at half speed. At the beginning of the song, uh, that's played just with downstrokes, and you let the first chord of each measure ring out for three beats. Later on in the song, um, you can strum that. Particularly if you were singing that by yourself, you would want to have that type of feel with it. And that's the verse for Yellow Submarine. This is the 
chorus section of Yellow Submarine by the Beatles. I'll play it at speed and then slow it down. There's only two chords used in the chorus. Those chords are a G major, which we've seen before, with the second finger on the second fret of the fifth string, the third finger on the third fret of the sixth string, and then the fourth finger on the third fret of the first string. A G major and then a D7. So that's the first finger on the first fret of the second string, second finger on the second fret of the third string, and then third finger on the second fret of the first string and play four strings for that one. Uh, for the chorus, it's a four measure cycle again. It's a measure of the G major going to two measures of the D7 back to a measure of G major, and then that will repeat again. Also, for the outro of the song, it's just the chorus repeated over and over again and then faded out. So I'll play the chorus slowly. And that's the chorus for Yellow Submarine. We all live in a yellow submarine. This is the interlude section of Yellow Submarine. I'll play it at speed and then slow it down. For this interlude section, uh, it starts out just like the verse and then goes away from that as it uh, goes into a part that features like a marching band sound. So the first part will have the same chords as the verse. We start with a D7, then go into a C, into the second ma measure with a G major, and then an E minor, going into the third measure with an A minor, to a C major, going to the next measure with a D7, then going to a G. So that's the first four measures, just like the verse. Then in the second four measures, it'll start again with a D7, going to a C major, and then a measure of a G major. And then the next two measures are very difficult to hear because the uh, marching band is played over them, but it sounds like a D7, then going to a G major, and then a D7, go into a G major, and then that'll go back to the chorus. So I'll play that interlude section at half speed. And that's the interlude for Yellow Submarine. This is the performance of Yellow Submarine. In the town where I was born Lived a man who sailed the sea And he told us of his life